Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be continuing our DP600 series and we're going to be looking at implementing and managing a data analytics environment. This is the second part of the DP600 syllabus or the study guide that we're going through on the channel. And today we're going to be going through these particular elements and these are coming straight from the study guide. So number one, we're going to be looking at implementing workspace and item level access control, implementing data sharing for workspaces, warehouses and lake houses, managing sensitivity labels, configuring fabric enabled workspace settings and managing fabric capacity. We've got five sample questions. So at the end of the video, we'll be going through some sample questions to test your knowledge. And as with the last video, I'll be posting the key points and links to further resources in the school community available for free. I'll leave a link in the description for that. We'll continue the scenario that we were developing in the last lesson. You're the main character again. Are you ready? Let's begin. So just to recap, you are a consultant and you're working with your client who is called Camilla. And in the last engagement, you successfully planned their data analytics environment. Now you've won the contract to support Camilla in implementing that solution. So Camilla is busy doing her resource planning. She's thinking about who she's going to need to support this environment in Fabric. She's asking for your assistance to help her structure her thoughts and also her team. So let's have a look at what that looks like in Fabric. So this is a high level structure of a Fabric implementation. Now you'll notice that it's hierarchical. At the top, we have tenant level. So this is kind of the one tenant that you're going to have in your organization. Then below that, you might have one or many capacities. And we talked about capacities in the previous lesson. We're going to be doing a bit more on capacities in this lesson as well. And then in each capacity, you might have one or multiple workspaces. Then in each workspace, we go down to the item level. So you might have a data warehouse and a lake house in your workspace. Then we can actually go one level deeper than that, which is called the object level. So within the data warehouse, you have dbo.customer. That might be a table in your data warehouse or a view in your data warehouse. That's at the object level. Now, when we're administering Fabric, we need to be aware of these different levels because at each of these different levels, administration happens in a different way. In the last lesson, we looked at the tenant level admin settings. So that's mostly things in the admin portal under the tenant settings section. Today, we will explore item level a little bit later on. But first, I just want to look at how we can administer each of these three top levels. So here we have a table. Now the table isn't complete yet. We're going to walk through it together. So we have the three top levels. We've got tenant level, the capacity level and the workspace level. And then on the right hand side, we're going to go through what the administrator or who the administrator is, what role they require and also where the admin happens. Right. So where are they going to be working? Where are the settings that they need to administer at each level. So starting at the top level, we've got the tenant admin. Now to get the rights to be able to be a tenant admin, we're actually going to go higher than fabric. We need an entra ID role of global administrator, power platform administrator, or fabric administrator. And we looked at what that looks like in the last lesson. And they're going to be working predominantly in the fabric admin portal. So if you have any of these three roles, that's going to be available to you and you can configure your tenant settings in there. One level down at the capacity level, well, the capacity admin is assigned when you create a new fabric capacity in Azure. Now where the administration happens, so any sort of administration at that capacity level is going to be done either in the Azure portal, as we mentioned before, or in the fabric admin portal as a section on capacity settings. We're going to have a look at both in a minute. At the workspace level, so we're going one level down now, you're going to have a workspace admin. They're going to be the person that is kind of in charge of that admin level. And the role required here is a workspace role. So it's going to be a person or a group with the workspace role of admin. And again, we'll have a look at what that means in more detail a bit later on. Now they're going to be doing most of their administration within the workspace settings and also within the manage access. So these are the two areas that they're going to be focusing most of their time on. Now we looked at the tenant level admin settings previously in the last video. In this lesson, we're going to focus on the capacity level settings and then the workspace level settings. So let's just focus in on the capacity administrator settings for a moment. And as I mentioned, there's two really places where capacity administration gets done. Number one is in Azure because we need to use Azure portal to purchase uh, capacity. 
right? So that's going to be where you go to create a new capacity, delete existing capacities, changing the size of a capacity. So if you've got an F2 SKU and you want to go up to an F4, that's going to be done in the admin portal and also changing the capacity administrator. So you can do that within the Azure portal as well. As well as that, within Fabric, we can change some of the settings for a particular capacity. So we can do things like enabling disaster recovery, viewing the capacity usage report. So how much is our capacity being used? We can define who can create workspaces within that capacity. We can define who is a capacity administrator. We can update the Power BI connection settings. So who can connect to this capacity or items within this capacity from Power BI and how does that look like? We can permit workspace admins to size their own custom spark pools. So this is quite important, right? Because you might want to set some sort of limits on the sizing of the spark pools that workspace owners underneath the capacity or in this capacity, you might want to limit how high they can go with their spark pools because that's going to have quite a big impact on the overall capacity usage. So if you're sitting at the capacity level, you might want to add some restrictions on you know, the custom spark configurations that happen in your capacity. And we can assign workspaces to the capacity in this section as well. Okay, so here we are in the portal and I just wanted to show you some of the capacity settings, how to administer a fabric capacity. I'm gonna start right from the beginning. So how do you actually set up and buy a capacity? Well, you go to Microsoft Fabric. If it's not already there, then you can just search for it here, Microsoft Fabric. This is gonna bring you through to the, the resource creation tool. We're gonna to click on create. And we're going to walk through these steps to create a fabric capacity. So you need a subscription and a resource group and you can enter the capacity name. So give it a region, change the size. I'm just going to do an F2, select. And here is where you sign the capacity administrator. And again, we can change that afterwards, but that's, you need at least one to set it up. So it's going to give you the estimated cost per month here, and then you press create and it's going to deploy that capacity. Okay. So now my capacity has been created. We can click on go to resource. And this is where we're going to do some of the administration tasks within the Azure portal, right? So here we can have a look at, well, firstly, we can pause it. So if you want to pause the capacity, you can do that here, delete it as well. Down the left hand side, we've got some useful things here. So capacity administrators, that's where you're going to change your capacity administrator. We've also got change size. So if you're finding that F2 is not enough for your workloads that you're running, you can change it to F4 or F256 if you've got a spare 40 grand a month to be using on Fabric. I'm going to keep it as an F2. That's just something to bear in mind there. Okay, now I just want to have a look at what that capacity setting looks like inside Fabric. So if we go to the admin portal and capacity settings, if we go over to the Fabric capacity tab here, we can see that Fabric capacity that we've just set up. So it's an F2, it's in UK South, and it's active. So we've got some actions here. We can change the name. We can have a look at the admin. You can't really do much there. There's a link through back into Azure. So if you wanna make any changes to it from within Fabric, you need to click on this link here. But if you click on the actual capacity name, we go through to the capacity settings, right? So this is where you're gonna be doing things like enabling disaster recovery, having a look at the usage report for that capacity, turning on notifications. So it's gonna give you a notification when you've used X amount of percent of your capacity. Updating who is the administrator for that capacity can also be done here. Changing how we can access Power BI and how Power BI can access data in the capacity. We've also got data engineering settings. It's mainly Spark settings. And this is where we're going to have that permission to permit people to change the custom Spark pooling, right? So either on or off. And we can assign certain workspaces to this capacity. So if you just create a new capacity, it's going to be empty and you can move existing workspaces onto that capacity. So as a workspace administrator, we've got a few different options. So here we're stepping down a level into the workspace level. And a workspace administrator, as we mentioned, deals primarily in the workspace settings. And here you can edit the license for the workspace. So change it from like for example, a trial capacity to a fabric capacity or from pro to PPU, premium per user. We can also configure connections to Azure as well, as well as configuring Azure DevOps connections. So if you want to use Git version control for this workspace, that's going to be done in the workspace settings. Another thing we can do in the workspace settings is set up what's called a workspace identity. 
Now, this is basically having a managed service principle dedicated for your workspace. And it basically means you can connect to things like ADLS Gen 2 for things like shortcuts. And you can do that in a kind of trusted workspace access manner, basically. This is another pretty new security feature that they've added quite recently. And I'll be going through more of the security principles in more detail, probably in a separate video at the end of this series, because they're quite important. We can also edit some of the Power BI settings in the workspace settings and also the Spark settings. So particular default environments that we might want to set up within this workspace, things like that. Just note here that managing access is done through the, the managing access section. So it's slightly separate. It's in the same kind of area, but it's not necessarily in workspace settings where we add users and add groups into our workspace. We'll have a look at that in a bit more detail. Okay, next, I just wanted to walk through some of the workspace settings in a bit more detail. So here we are in a workspace, it's called ShareHub. What we're gonna be doing is clicking on these dot, and you can see that we've got two here that are useful for workspace administrators. Number one is managing access. So this is how we're gonna give people access to our workspace, either a person or a group. We can add people in here and we can give them admin, member, contributor, or viewer. If we click on these dots again and then go through to the workspace settings, this is where we're gonna be able to edit some of the settings for our workspace. General is where you just do the image and the description, and also domains if you're using domains. License info, so this is where you're gonna change the potential capacity and the license that's being used in that workspace. So this one is a trial workspace, so Maybe we want to actually change that to an F2. Maybe we've got some fabric capacity. We can select which one we want to use. I'm going to be using this fabric F2 learn capacity, and that's going to change the license for that workspace. We've also got connecting to Azure, connecting to Git, downloading things like the file explorer as well, and enabling caching for shortcuts is another workspace setting we've got here. Managed identities. So if you're on an F64 capacity or higher, you can make use of workspace identities. And that's gonna basically allow you to create kind of like a managed service principle just for this workspace. So give your workspace an identity and allow it to connect to ADLS Gen 2, create your shortcuts, things like that in a secure manner, kind of trusted workspace access is what it's called. And if you wanna learn more about that, I'll leave a link to the workspace identity section in the school community. We can also do th things like adding private endpoints and that kind of thing for connecting via Spark to things in Azure. You've got your Spark settings down here for configuring something about the pool that you're using, the Spark pool that is being used in this workspace. You can change the default environment. That's where you're gonna be going to add libraries and things like that. So if you wanna pre-install Python packages onto your Spark cluster, so that every time you run a notebook or start a new notebook, you have those libraries there ready to go. That's where you do this. Change some settings for high concurrency and that kind of thing there. So Camilla says, okay, great. I now have some clarity on administering fabric at the tenant capacity in the workspace level. What I'm not sure about is giving access to the people on my team. So that's important, right? We build all these things in fabric, but how can we give people access, the right amount of access to these items? Let's have a look at that in a bit more detail. So if we go back to our structure of a fabric implementation, generally when we're sharing items with people, that's really done at these bottom three levels of our fabric architecture, right? So sharing things in Fabric is normally done at these three levels. Now, object level sharing is possible for the data warehouse and the SQL endpoint in the lake house, but I don't think it's assessed as part of this exam. So it's not part of the study guide in any way. So we're not gonna be covering that in this lesson. There's some documentation on the Microsoft Learn website, and I'll leave a link to that if you're interested in object level sharing, if you wanna learn a bit more about that. We're gonna be focusing on the workspace level sharing and item level sharing. So let's just start with workspace level sharing. People or groups can be given workspace level access. And when sharing, the personal group is assigned a workspace role. As you can see on the right hand side there, we've got admin, member, contributor, and viewer. Now this role applies to all items in the workspace. For example, a viewer in the workspace will be able to view all of the items in the workspace. Let's just take a bit of a moment because roles are really important and the role that you assign someone dictates basically what they can do in your workspace. This image here comes from the Microsoft documentation. Again, I'll leave a link to this in the school community and I definitely recommend you take some time to study it. 
this is what we're going to be doing here. So the first thing to note with this diagram is let's just start with the admin. So if you give someone an admin permission, what can they do? The first thing is that they can update and delete the workspace. So this is a really high level permissions that only maybe one or two people really should have people that you trust in your organization. They can also add and remove people, including other admins. So it's the only role that allows you to add an admin, add another admin. Next, we move down to the member and the member can do similar things to an admin, but they can't add an admin, okay? So a member cannot add an admin. They can only add people with lower permissions or other members, okay? The other permission that is unique at the member level is you can give other people the permission to share items. So being able to share items is a fairly high level thing to do and you're giving people that permission to share, okay? So that's something to bear in mind as well. Then we move down to the contributor level. Now, contributors can do pretty much everything in the workspace other than, as we see here, deleting the workspace, adding other people into the workspace and allowing other people to share. But they can do when you're talking about you know, contributing to fabric items, anything around lake houses or warehouses or data pipelines, they have read and write access to all of these things. So the viewer has a unique set of missions, those six green ticks. And if we go kind of from top to bottom, they can view and read content in a data pipeline, a notebook, Spark job definition, machine learning model. So they can view kind of the outputs of these things. They can also view and read the content of KQL, databases, query sets, and real-time dashboards. They can connect to the SQL analytics endpoint of a lake house or a data warehouse. And they can read lake house and data warehouse data and shortcuts with T-SQL. So the viewer can basically use SQL to analyze data in either the lake house or the data warehouse. What they can't do is access any of the OneLake APIs or Spark. So they can't run Spark jobs or notebooks or anything like that. Now, one unique thing about the viewer permission is in the data pipelines. Now they can't edit or update any of the activities in a data pipeline, but they can execute and cancel the execution of a data pipeline run. So that's an important kind of edge case to remember for the exam. And they can also finally view the output of data pipelines, notebooks, and machine learning models. So that's kind of a high level overview of all of these workspace roles and what they can do at each level. Again, this is really important to understand for the exam. So I definitely recommend going into the documentation, taking some time to understand these different things because you'll probably be tested quite a lot on these. So let's just have a bit of a workspace level access example. This is John. He is a business analyst working in Camilla's team. And Camilla has asked you to give him contributor access to Workspace ONE. This is Workspace ONE. This is the architecture that they've got here. Now, this is what John's access currently looks like, where the red box is basically no access at all and a green box if there's any access. And you can see everything's red. So currently he has no access to anything. You are an admin in the Workspace. Now, what steps would you take to give John this access? Have a little think about that and then we'll talk about it in a second. Okay, so what steps would you take? Well, personally, what I would be asking is, does John fit into an existing security group that has contributor access to the workspace? Because best practice here is to add people into groups rather than adding them individually. It just makes maintenance in the future a lot easier. Where possible, we always want to add people into groups before we add them individually. Now, if a security group doesn't exist, then you might wanna create one for John. Maybe you want to create an analyst security group so that in the future, when another analyst wants to join the team or join the workspace, you can just add that person into the group rather than having this long list of individual contributors in that workspace. So you create an analyst security group, add John to the security group and give the group contributor access to workspace one. So in the picture, how does that update? Well, it looks a bit like this, right? So John now has access to workspace one and everything within it, because we've given him access, or the security group access at that workspace level. You'll notice that workspace two, he still has no access to that. He can't even see that. So that's something to bear in mind when you're giving workspace level access. Camilla suddenly rings you. She realizes that John shouldn't have access to everything in the workspace. Instead, she wants you to give him access to the data warehouse only, not the semantic model, 
not the data pipeline. So how would you change what we've just done to reflect this? So this is what we're, we're looking at here. We want to go from this, which is the arrangement that we've just done for John at the workspace level, to this at the item level. Now this might be important because it kind of reflects quite an important principle when it comes to giving people access, which is the principle of least privilege. Now in general, in data systems, information security, we want to give people the amount of access that they need to perform their roles and nothing more, right? So if you don't technically need access to the semantic model or the data pipeline, then one way of kind of getting around that is to give people item level access, giving people access to only what they need. Okay, just to recap on some of the additional permissions. So when you share a data warehouse, you get these three additional permissions. We have read all data using SQL. And what that means is it allows people to read all objects within the warehouse using T-SQL. We also have the read all one lake data. And with this, you're allowing that person to read the underlying one lake files using Spark, pipelines, anything else basically. So in the top one, they can only use SQL. If you give them the second permission, it allows them to basically do anything with that data. And the third permission allows the user to build reports on the default semantic model. Not any custom models, just the default semantic model. When it comes to the lake house, these permissions are similar, but they're just worded a little bit differently. So again, if you give them the read all SQL endpoint data, it allows them to perform T-SQL on the T-SQL endpoint. If you give them read all Apache Spark, then again, it's going to allow them to run notebooks and Spark code on top of that data. And again, the build report on the default semantic model does exactly what it says on the tin. Now, one point that I just did want to make here is around one lake data access model. Now, this is a very newly announced feature, so it might not have made its way into the exam yet. But I do think it's going to have a very big impact on how we manage security in Fabric going forward. So I did want to at least mention it here. I'm not going to be going through it in detail, but I did just want to flag it. You might want to have a look at the documentation page just so that you can become aware of it. Now, this feature is not really something I've looked at yet much in detail, but from just from looking at the documentation, from how I understand it, is it's going to allow you to perform RBAC, so role-based access control, on things like folders. So now that they've implemented folders within a workspace, it's going to allow you to define a specific role or give a specific role access control over that folder. And then the permissions are going to be inherited for every item in that folder. But like I mentioned, it's a preview feature and it's relatively new. So I'd be surprised if they ask you about this in the exam, but it is very important. I do think it will change quite a lot in Fabric. So I wanted to mention it. And if you look at the study guide, it does say for the DP600 exam, it does say that most questions cover features that are generally available. The exam may contain questions on preview features if those features are commonly used. Well, I think at the moment this isn't commonly used because it's only been released a few weeks ago. So that's something to bear in mind. Camilla says, thank you. Now I understand workspace level and item level sharing in more detail. One last thing before you go, we've been working on this government project and I need to apply sensitivity labeling in a workspace. Can you walk me through it? So what even is a sensitivity label? Well, sensitivity labels are a data governance feature and they're created and managed in Microsoft Purview. So fabric items, such as a semantic model, can be given a sensitivity label, such as confidential, right? And it's for information protection purposes. Now, in some industries, labeling data and information with a sensitivity label is necessary for compliance with information protection regulations. Now, to apply a sensitivity label in Fabric, really there's two main methods. If we go into that item, for example, this lake house here, we have in the top toolbar, you've got the sensitivity label and you can just click on that drop down, change the sensitivity label in there. The other option is to go into the settings of that particular fabric item. And you can see that in the left hand toolbar there, you've got sensitivity label and you can change the sensitivity label in there. Now, one of the options that you can give it if you go through the settings method is to apply to downstream items. So again, we've got that notion or that concept of inheritance of the label that you give it here also applies to everything downstream. Okay, so now we are gonna test some of your knowledge for everything that we've learned in this section of the study guide. And we're gonna start with a case study style question. So we're gonna go going through a bit of a case study and then gonna be asked three 
maybe four questions on this particular case study. Let's begin. Toby creates a new workspace with some fabric items to be used by data analysts. Toby creates a new security group called Data Analysts. He includes himself as a member of this security group. Toby gives the Data Analyst security group a viewer role in the workspace. What workspace role does Toby have? Is it A, viewer, B, member, C, admin, or D, contributor? Pause the video here, have a think, and then we'll move forward to the answer. So the answer here is C. Now this combines two pretty important concepts to understand when we're looking at workspace level sharing. Number one is that the creator of a workspace is always given admin permissions in that workspace. Now we also have Toby with the viewer role in that workspace because he's in the security group with viewer role. And this is another concept. If you have more than one level of permission within the workspace, you're always given the higher level. So he's got admin role because he created the workspace and he's got viewer role because he's in that security group. Well, the admin permissions is always going to be prioritized. He's always going to take that role over his viewer role. So let's continue this case study. Sarah is also a member of that data analyst security group. She has no other role in the workspace. Which of the following can Sarah not do in the workspace? A, execute a data pipeline, run SQL scripts in the data warehouse, run Spark notebook, or review the evaluation metrics of a machine learning model. Now the answer here is C, run the Spark notebook. Now, when we were looking at the workspace level roles and the permissions for each role, we know that Sarah is a viewer in the workspace. That's the highest level of permission. And you'll remember that a viewer role can actually execute a data pipeline in a workspace. They can also run T-SQL scripts in data warehouse or a SQL endpoint of a lake house. What they can't do is run a Spark notebook. Okay, so anything in a notebook, they can have a look at the notebook, but they can't actually execute any code. So C is the right answer, because what we're looking for is what can she not do in the workspace? And D is review the evaluation metrics of a machine learning model, which we know we can do because she's just reading the output of that model. To continue this case study again, Toby wants to delegate some of the management responsibility in the workspace. He wants to give this person the ability to share content within the workspace, invite new contributors to the workspace, but not add new admins to the workspace. What role should Toby give this person? A, admin, B, member, C, contributor, or D, viewer? So the answer here is B. Now the, the key point in the question was, but not add new admins to the workspace. So we know that to be able to add another admin into a workspace, you need to have admin permissions yourself. So Toby doesn't want to give that person this ability, basically. So we know it can't be admin. It's not going to be viewer, and it's not going to be contributor. We know that the member is kind of one down from admin, and that's going to allow you to do all of these three things. They can share content, they can invite other contributors, because a member can add new people, either members or contributors, or viewers, but they can't add other admins. So it'd be B, member. The next question is completely separate. You have admin role in a workspace. Sheila is a data engineer in your team. She currently has no access to this workspace at all. Now Sheila needs to update a data transformation script in a PySpark notebook. And the script gets data from a lakehouse table, cleans it, and then writes it to a table in the same lakehouse. Now you want to adhere to the principle of least privilege. What actions should you take to enable this? Is it A, you're gonna give Sheila the contributor role in the workspace. B, share the lake house item with read all Spark data permission. C, give Sheila the admin role in the workspace. Or D, share the lake house item with read all Spark data permissions and share the notebook with edit permissions. So the answer here is D. So one of the clues in this question was the line where it says you want to adhere to the principle of least privilege. So immediately when you see that, giving people workspace level access is not really good enough. So A and C is giving a role in the workspace. So it's gonna enable her to contribute and change and edit everything in the workspace, but it doesn't adhere to the principle of least privilege. So we can immediately rule out A and C. So another really important point in the question here was Sheila needs to update a data transformation script in a notebook. So she needs to edit the code in a notebook. She's not just executing an existing notebook. She needs to actually ch make changes to a notebook. And so for B, you wouldn't have that permission. You've got read all data for the Spark. So you can actually execute a notebook, but you can't edit a notebook. 
To be able to make these changes, really need access to the notebook and the lake house that that notebook is interfacing with, that that notebook is reading from. Because you can't just share the notebook because then you won't have access to the underlying data. And we can't just share the lake house because you won't have access to the notebook that she needs to edit. So the answer is D, share the lake house item, we're giving Spark permissions, and we're also giving edit permissions on the notebook. Next question, you have admin role in a workspace. You want to pre-install some useful Python packages to be used across all notebooks in the workspace. How do you achieve this? A, in the Fabric admin portal, go to Spark settings and install the libraries. B, go to workspace settings, Spark settings, and then library management. C, create an environment, install the packages in the environment, go to the workspace settings, Spark settings, and set it as the default environment. Or D, go to capacity settings, and then default libraries. So the answer here is C, creating an environment and then going into your workspace settings and setting it as the default environment for, for Spark. Now, this is a bit of a, a naughty question because B is the old way. So it used to be you go to workspace settings, Spark settings, and there was a section for library management, but that's actually not possible anymore. The way to do it, as I mentioned, is to create an environment and then in your Spark settings, make it the default environment. A and D don't actually exist, these capabilities. So these kind of red herrings. So the answer is C. Camilla says, thanks. She's seriously impressed with your knowledge again. In this lesson, we covered all five of these elements of the DP600 study guide from workspace and item level sharing, data sharing for data warehouses and lake houses, sensitivity labeling, and then workspace and capacity level settings. And the good news is, again, you've won an extension to the contract. Camilla would like you to implement control over the entire analytics development lifecycle in her organization. So for this, we're talking version control, deployment pipelines, Power BI projects, all that good stuff. That's what we'll be looking at in the next lesson. So click here to continue that lesson.